Hello everyone, thanks for joining us on this midweek edition of Inside Africa. The peace deal signed on Sunday by African leaders aimed at ending the conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo is expected to lead to the introduction of an international neutral force which will have the mandate to fight against any rebel group in the country. But even as the leaders work on the agreement, its implementation is faced with many challenges. African leaders have signed a UN-mandated agreement aimed at ending two decades of conflict in a troubled east of Democratic Republic of Congo. The leaders signed the deal on Sunday in the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon attended the signing ceremony. He said the pact is only the beginning of a comprehensive approach that will require sustained engagement. The agreement could lead to the formation of a regional force in the mineral-rich DRC to combat rebels. The President of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Joseph Kabila, and his government were also given the responsibility of stabilizing the country, using this deal as a good opportunity. Our commitment to stability and development uh, bearing or taking into consideration the fact that there is no development where there is no peace. Uh, we are that determined to make sure that we bring about peace and stability for our people, but definitely for the region. The African leaders were originally set to sign the agreement last month, but the deal was called off when concerns were expressed about who would lead a new regional force. Now that the greatly expected peace agreement was signed, all lies on those who should make sure the deal can be translated into practice. That includes the African Union. From the AU side, we will obviously mobilize the African Union, the international community together with the UN to support the work that needs to be done, including what needs to be done by the DRC, and we'll also play the advocacy role that we will be needed for this mission and for the DRC itself. However, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon trusts more measures should be taken to bring the much desired stability to the Great Lakes region. The Security Council uh, has been uh, discussing the idea of uh, uh, deploying intervention brigade. Uh, uh, this will be uh, discussed and decided by the Security Council soon, and the signing of this uh, document will really uh, facilitate the process of this uh, deploying intervention uh, forces with the uh, enforcing mandate. Still, many believe the real answer for the DR Congo problem should not emanate from any military action. Empowering the public via education, economy and good governance could prevent any possible agony there. In Ghana, the Upper Regional Anti-Smuggling Task Force has issued a strong warning that filling stations cut smuggling fuel or conniving with smugglers will be closed down. The license, the license of such a filling stations will further be withdrawn and the owners are prosecuted. Uh, chairman of the task force, DCOP, Kofi Danso Ade Achiampong, uh, gave the warning at a news conference at war. The 50-member anti-fuel smuggling task force was formed to reduce or eliminate the spate of fuel smuggling in the region, especially at the borders with Burkina Faso. It is made up of personnel from the police, military, customs, excise and preventive service, and the immigration service. The chairman of the task force, DCOP Kofi Danswa Daya Champion, said the task force has directed fuel filling stations not to sell fuel in containers. DCOP Adai Champon outlined the mandate of the task force. The task force operates mainly at the border areas or communities, especially the approved and unapproved entry points for vehicular transport and pedestrians. Fuel stations caught conniving or involved in smuggling activities are to be prosecuted. The allowances the will be withdrawn and the stations closed down. DCOP Adaya Champon said barely two weeks after the formation of the task force, it had seized a reasonable quantity of fuel. Five drums of diesel, 23 liters of diesel gamma oil, 
eight jerry cans, that is 35 gallons of petrol, were seized on Monday, 12 February 2013. Then on Tuesday, 2,202.50 liters of petrol, and then 112.5 liters of diesel were seized. Over in South Africa, the Marikana Commission of Inquiry heard evidence that some of the striking mine workers bore scars of a ritual incisions. Advocate Ishmael Semenya says a place will show that at least 17 miners had uh, scars from martyr rituals, uh, rituals uh, which uh, could have made them belligerent, uh, aggressive, uh, and uh, believe that uh, they were invincible. Semenya made the statement uh, while uh, cross-examining Sefeta Pasha, a survivor of the Marikana event. Ishmael Semenya presented a version very different to that of Sepete Pasha. Pasha says these men were running away from the Kopi and trying to get home. He was one of them. But Semenya says he'll call a witness who'll testify that these miners were part of a warrior group, led by a man known as Mambush, or the man in the green blanket. They were fully armed and fortified with muti made from sheep's ashes. Two sons of a Sangoma were procured who performed various rituals on the Mambush group. On the copy, there was a distinct group of the warriors who were called Makalapa, and you were part of it. Makalapa is the protective head, the helmet, which we put underground. And that the warrior group was fortified in their belief of invincibility because the security tried to fire rubber bullets at them and they came out of that unscathed. Semenya asked if Pasha too bore scars of rituals performed by a Sangoma. Pasha replied he did this in the past when his body was itchy, but he no longer does it since he's a Christian. He declined to show his scars or to be examined by a doctor. But he did show the commission his injury from the 16th of August. We are still in South Africa and this time around another woman has been cured in the Western Cape, the third tell in less than a month. The body of the 34-year-old was found at a Kanana informal settlement on the Cape Flats on Monday morning. A neighbor discovered Zuzeka Sojourner's body between shacks and alerted police. Residents say... This is not the first incident of this nature in the area. The Sojourner family is trying to come to terms with their loss. The last time I saw her was yesterday at about 8 o'clock. She was walking me to go catch a taxi. I remember she said she wants to see me leave so she knows I'm safe. Sojourner sustained head injuries. Police would not confirm whether she was raped. From the side of the police, it's difficult at this stage to speculate as to the circumstances as to whether the woman was raped or not. But I would suggest that we leave that to the investigation to tell us what happened. The community wants steps taken to ensure their safety. It is now so dangerous for people to walk around at night. The patrol must be back. And if we saw someone doing something bad with somebody, they can just make a plan so that the crime must be stopped. The problem here is that people know what's going on, but they don't want to say. Especially the mothers. They hide information when it's their sons. Tomorrow it could be them or their sisters. What then? Activists have added their concerns. The facts are very clear that people are being raped and abused constantly every single day and so if you didn't hear about it now i don't know where you've been because it's actually it's nothing new and that to, to me is so horrific and i'm really asking what can we do about this no arrests have yet been made in connection with sojourner's murder Talking education now, the University of Haramaya in Ethiopia is training over 31,000 students of various compositions in 224 fields of studies. President of the university, Dr. Girma Amente, emphasizes that a quality education is not a compromise and that his institution is working towards the same course. 
Establishing a robust educational system is incorporated within Ethiopia's five-year ground economic plan, ensuring quality and training students more of in science and technology fields has been emphasized to push the country's move to industrialization forward. During my recent visit to Haramaya University, I have talked to the president of the university, Dr. Grima Amante, on a host of subjects. Concerning academic interventions, the president confirms that maintaining quality education has been the blood and flesh of the institution. Our focus is now in the future, more to work on the area of quality, uh, and as well as uh, expanding our programs to the areas where um, our growth and transformation plan uh, requires to have a trained manpower. And the other one is uh, as much as possible um, to give our students um, the required skills and knowledge so that when, whenever they go out that they fit into what the industry requires. Professor Chamada Peninsa is academic vice president at Haramaya University and speaks about the weight given to science and technology streams. In recognition to the government policy, uh, our enrollment is 83% of our students are in the fields of natural science and technology. Only 17% are uh, in the field of social sciences. This means that we are working toward this uh, the national policy. Back to Dr. Grima, he expresses determination of his institution to regain the natural setting of Haramaya and its environs. It is always good to conserve nature. It, it is not uh, uh, really such easy to, to, to bring it back compared to really conserving it as it is. But this is one of the areas um, I'm really uh, working um, with really special attention. Especially this is part of, of course, also our community uh, activity. And it's not only really physically doing something on the ground as as a knowledge center, we have to really advise even uh, by providing data and information on the sustainable utilization of natural resources to our stakeholders in the surrounding. After all, the president underscores that Haramaya University remains dedicated to push these fingerprints to expedite national development by generating productive and innovative human power. Haramaya University uh, is determined uh, to do its level best in terms of producing the required manpower, in terms of um, quality, as well as in terms of uh, uh, composition, um, uh, as far as quality uh, manpower concerned, as well as to engage ourselves in, in the area of research uh, to address uh, research uh, agendas. The University of Armai is currently training more than 31,000 students of various compositions under 224 fields of studies. So let's do so, ER20 News. Looking at something else other than education, agricultural experts unveil that uh, Korea-Ethiopia Joint Agriculture Research Program has the potential to improve the uh, to improve uh, and uh, diversify Ethiopia's agriculture through knowledge and experience sharing uh, with Korea. Korea uh, projects on international agriculture copia in collaboration with Kolata Agriculture Research Center has uh, demonstrated its uh, successful Korean seed varieties to stakeholders. Korea Project on International Agriculture, COPIA, is a bilateral cooperation program aimed to share Korea's knowledge and experience on the development of agricultural technology and extension to partner countries to help them improve their food production and realize sustainable agricultural development. Established in 2009, COPIA is operating in 15 countries and extended its project to Ethiopia since 2011 in a bid to pave the way for further agricultural development and strengthening the existing strong bilateral relations between Korea and Ethiopia. The project has so far able to hybrid more than 15 Korean selected seed varieties adaptable to Ethiopian agricultural environments. Such exportable varieties are believed to increase the income of Ethiopian farmers and enhance the ongoing economic growth the country has been achieving. Dr. Hyun Mok Cho is director of Copia Ethiopia. 
He speaks about the prospect of the project. Uh, uh, this kind of uh, horticultural uh, crops are more uh, income generating uh, compared to other uh, cereal uh, crops. So uh, in the future, uh, I am going to uh, distribute uh, new crops and new varieties uh, to Ethiopian farmers. Uh, at the same time, uh, I am uh, trying to uh, uh, transfer uh, cultivation technology together uh, so that uh, Ethiopian farmers can uh, produce uh, new crops and uh, new uh, uh, horticultural products uh, by themselves. 60 Ethiopian researchers are working closely with Korean expertise and they also said the center is contributing towards improving and diversifying Ethiopia's agriculture through sharing Korea's experience in the sector. Speaking on the field visit co-organized by Copia and Partners, Deputy Director for the Ethiopian Institute for Agricultural Research said Ethiopia has a lot to learn from Koreans. We are learning money from the many experiences. Uh, uh, some of our researchers visit Korea. Uh, they learn how they do the skills, capacity, institutional buildings. We are collaborating with each other in the two days event is to show some of the successful vegetable research and the production here in Ethiopia. Korean ambassador to Ethiopia, Jun Jun Kim, on his past said this project is one of the Koreans' commitments to pay back the priceless generosity of Ethiopians during their fight for freedom and liberty 50 years before. The bilateral relation between the two countries is getting momentum in every sphere, he added. You know, they're just after Korean War. Our the agricultural productivity was one of the lowest in the world. But nowadays, our agricultural productivity rate is the, one of the best in the world. Well, uh, we know where well the great potential of uh, Ethiopia's agricultural sector. If uh, you just adopted some uh, special variety and uh, some special uh, skills for increase the productivity rate, According to the center, the selected varieties and cultural practices will be introduced to farmers and would be used for household and commercial production just in the coming few months. Let's now take you to Uganda and just a week since Panya Iziba Services Sister Operations, the Kampala Capital City Authority. KCCA says it is worth seeking 790 billion shillings to revamp the city's infrastructure to support uh, an improved uh, public transport system. Uh, industry watchers are insisting that the authority may require to uh, put more focus on how best it delivers services, such as uh, opening up uh, public transport tenders to competitive bidding. Public transport fares across selected routes in and out of the city have now moved up by nearly 40 percent. Partial at peak hours for commuter traffic, with observers holding adequate knowledge of the sector, arguing that the authority will remain under pressure to decongest the city. If you are to think through the current infrastructures, they are far below the required standard. Two, in to have an efficient public transport in Kampala, we must avoid political patronage. You cannot bring in people selectively to run a, a, a public transport system. The aspect of competitive bidding rather than single sourcing remains important in enhancing efficiency in the delivery of public transport, according to Athanasius Rutaro, a lecturer at Makere University Business School, MOBS. We can't also run an efficient public system when part of the road network is actually hired to an individual. In the name of parking, it doesn't make economic sense at all. However, Kampala Capital City Authority says its fine-tuning modalities to raise staggering $310 million it expects to secure through counterpart funding to revamp and modernize the city's transport infrastructure if improvements are to be realized. 80 kilometers of uh, Kampala roads are to be upgraded from uh, Maram to bitumen standards. Uh, 70 kilometers of, of, of uh, our roads are to be reconstructed. We're also planning to uh, uh, signalize 15 junctions within uh, Kampala city. Mm, we're hoping that all these efforts will go into improving the transport system 
The entry of the Pioneer bus services last year was seen as a significant boost against the congestion of the city's narrow roads by commuter taxis, as well as enabling passengers pay less in transport fares. Raina Ogden, NTV Business. Bringing you more news from Uganda, the civil society is opposing the proposal to attach the property of individuals are close to grafter suspects as contained in the anti-corruption amendment bill 2012. The activists say this could punish innocent people closer to the suspect. However, the members of parliament are seeking to speed up the enactment of the law say it will not be amended. The anti-corruption bill, which was first proposed late last year and is seen as Uganda's hope to reduce corruption, has now attracted the interest of civil society organizations. They are not happy with the proposal to confiscate the property owned or controlled by the suspects as a penalty to recover the embezzled money. The activists met with the members of parliament voting for the bill. We therefore commend Mr. Chairman that section 11 subsection 2 clause b should be reviewed to state that the property of the close relatives and all associates will be confiscated when proven to have abetted or been acquired fully or partially from the proceeds of the corrupt acts in question however the mps say many corrupt officers hide their property under names of third party entities like their children wives or even under certain company names it is them now to convince court out of evidence adduced that the property that an investigator, that uh, an authorized officer of the IG or DPP wants to confiscate is their own property. So that part which deals with the protection of the rights of, with the genuine rights of third parties as per the new bill which is coming out, we have expanded it. The proposed law seeks to include the confiscation of the suspect's property, whether or not it is directly linked to corruption. It holds that it may not always be possible to prove that a property is linked to corruption. The civil society organizations were assured, however, that they will be consulted before the final draft is tabled in a parliament. In Kenya, the National Social Security Fund, NSSF, is, has expressed interest to construct a tunnel uh, suspended the bridge across the Likoni Channel connecting the south and north coast of Mombasa. This is part of the fund's ambitious strategy to make a strategic investments that guarantee high returns as part of its uh, corporate transformation strategies with uh, assets estimated to be in excess of 99.3 billion shillings. NSSF is looking for a new investment uh, opportunity while at the same time reducing its stake holding in real estate. Over the past 10 years, the country has been on an aggressive infrastructure development project in an effort to boost economic growth. Besides opening up avenues to encourage economic activity, infrastructure gives investors an opportunity to be big as the government continues to encourage public-private partnership projects. This has not gone past the 100 billion shilling fund that now eyes an opportunity to double its profits by financing the Likoni Channel project or even Kenya's second superhighway. The Likoni Channel is critical in opening up the south coast to tourism, investment and trade, particularly with Tanzania. Now that the investment horizon is limited, NSSM has taken a deliberate uh, uh, policy decision that we will invest in infrastructural projects projects of high impact, high value, both for returns for our invest, uh, on our investment and also for social development. With massive resources at its disposal, within the energy sector, NSSF is seeking to invest in energy production and transmission. This is part of the fund's policy to diversify its investments beyond the equities and property development portfolio. If Kenyans were to invest and save more with us, then we must have an, 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 an avenue for those investment uh, for the for the monies that we are collecting and that's where we intend to go as at the end of 2011 nsf assets were valued at 99.2 billion shillings with 29 percent invested in listed shares while 25 percent was in government securities nssf has previously been on the spot of a fund mismanagement across the board the institution has however of late turned a new leaf promising to prudently manage and return value to the fund base 
The International Criminal Court of Prosecutor Fatou Bensouda has admitted there could be flaws in the case of facing former head of uh, Kenya Civil Service Ambassador Francis Muthaura and says she is not opposed to having uh, the case uh, referred back to the pre-trial chamber should the uh, chamber deem it uh, fit. At the same time, uh, Bensouda is proposing that the commencement of uh, the trial for rem the remaining three suspects, including Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto, be, be postponed from April to August. In what could be good news for former head of civil service Ambassador Francis Mathaura, the ICC prosecutor acknowledges that there could be flaws in the case facing him and says is not opposed to the case being referred back to the pretrial chamber to decide whether Mathaura should actually stand trial. The prosecution states that a witness no longer relied upon by the prosecution was essential on the issue of Mudaura's criminal responsibility and in fact was the only direct witness against him. A similar application by Uhuru Kenyatta, however, was denied. During the status conference 12 days ago, the defense team of all the four Kenyan suspects pleaded with the court to postpone the commencement date of the trials, claiming that the prosecution had frustrated them with regards to disclosure of witnesses and evidence and were therefore not prepared. It doesn't give me any uh, great pleasure to seek to delay a trial date, but I am advising the court that in these circumstances it is so extreme that I have to. In her submission to the court in response to the request by the defense teams, ICC prosecutor Fatou Ben Suda said that though prosecution had complied with the set deadlines in disclosing evidence to the defense teams, she said she would not object to that plea. During the status conference, the defense had been asked to estimate how much time it needed in order to adequately prepare for the trials. Can you suggest uh, approximately how much time you need? We would request for a period of up to four months from the last date of a de definite disclosure on the part of the prosecution. The prosecution recommends that the chamber fixes a new date now to provide more certainty for the parties and victims. Bensuda argues that it is important for the Kenyan public, particularly the victims of the 2007-2008 post-election violence, to be assured that the trial will in fact commence in the coming months. In that regard, the prosecution is suggesting an August 2013 start date, or even earlier. Bin Suda's office is satisfied that by then, the defense teams will have been adequately prepared to face the trials. More importantly for the prosecution, though, is that it expects protective measures for the delayed disclosure witnesses to be finalized in the coming weeks, such that full disclosure can take place. Ben Suda admits that the identities of five witnesses have remained undisclosed, but explains that it was for reasons outside the prosecution's control. She, however, defended her office of claims by the defense that it had altered the case altogether. The case is shifting and changing. The way the prosecution have conducted this case is to have one case as a decoy, where all the defense attention is on another date, based upon another witness, and on the eve of trial, two months before the trial, hey presto, at, like a rabbit out of the hat, they come up with new allegations that simply have not been investigated. Mensuda reiterates that neither the crimes charged nor their temporal or territorial scope has changed. Mensuda has argued that the prosecution was so far frustrated by what she termed as lack of cooperation from the Kenyan government side. The trials were initially planned to start on April 10th and 11th. The trial chamber is now set to rule in the coming days on both the request by the defense and the concurrence by the prosecution on the trial dates, which are now likely to change. With that report, we come to the end of this edition of Inside Africa. Thanks for watching, and please stay tuned for our programs continue.